Good morning and welcome to the Fix Wing Guide channel. My name's Stuart Lomas. A very, very good, peaceful and hopefully nice for you Easter Sunday. Hope you've had a nice weekend so far and hopefully most of you will have another day off tomorrow. Um, let's just sort this out a little bit. There you go. Um, I want to talk to you today about when I was young um, because that's been brought back into very sharp focus um, yesterday by the um, reworking and relaunch of Thunderbirds. Um, it first hit our screens here in the UK um, back in 1965, um, so 50 years ago, 50 years. Um, I remember when I was five um, watching <coughs> a succession of uh, Jerry Anderson um, programs. Now, uh, there may well be you out there who are watching this nonsense um, who are as old as me, not quite as old as me, and maybe um, young who have discovered the pleasures and delights and wonderment of Jerry Anderson. Uh, Jerry Anderson was a very forward looking guy. He, like a lot of um, science fiction kind of guys um, could see where we were going as a as a civilization and, and made it come true years before our time. Um, and there was a few of, of his things that um, were a little bit before my time, but as I've got older, I've caught up on them, and they were repeated occasionally. Um, you know, Four Feather Falls, which was a Western-based puppet show. Um, Supercar, uh, with Mike Mercury. Um, Stingray, of course, um, which was, if you're very quick, and you do watch the relaunch of Thunderbirds, I go, um, there's a little homage to Stingray right at the beginning. Watch out for that. Um, Fireball XL5 with Steve Zodiac and his co-pilot Robbie the Robot. Um, Thunderbirds, of course. Um, moving on to things like Captain Scarlet, which was read on CGI a couple of years ago now. Well worth a watch if you are a fan of the old stuff from the 60s that Jerry Anderson was involved in. Very, very well made. Captain Scarlet um, um, Space 1999, um, UFO, um, Secret Service, now there's one not many remember, check that out. Um, <clears throat> another one from when I was young, uh, Joe 90, about a uh, young boy um, whose father worked for a secret organisation and Joe um, could have memory or brain implants, um, not actual physical implants, but uh, electronic, um, which enabled him at the age of 11, I think he was, to do absolutely anything. Fly a jet, be a secret agent, you know, whatever. Um, now, when I was a boy, um, Joe had very blonde hair and wore glasses. When I was young, I had very blonde hair and wore very similar glasses as to Joe. Uh, and that school, I was called Joe 90, which was, in my head, quite a nice compliment. But anyway, um, I uh, wander off the subject. Thunderbirds. Um, Thunderbirds, to me, has always been a very special part of my life. I was um, an enormous fan. Uh, and I remember I was uh, um, on my own with my mum and dad for seven years before my sister came along. So therefore, uh, generally I, I got what I wanted. My parents were working class. They were very uh, hard working. My dad was very hard working. He was a heavy engineer. Um, and, and, and I tried hard not to ask a lot, but you know, you, you do hope that Father Christmas will bring uh, what you ask for down the chimney on uh, Christmas Day. Uh, and over a couple of years, I um, obtained all of the, of, the, of the Thunderbirds um, and there were variations I had all sorts I had um, the small ones that you used to make that, uh, that uh, Dinky uh, used to manufacture but also I had the huge great things I mean you know difficult to do on the screen but um, to give you you know Thunderbird 1 must have stood 
18 inches high. Uh, the same kind of thing for Thunderbird 2 with um, droppable pods and it had a Thunderbird 4 inside the pod and I had a Thunderbird 4 which was, I don't know, I guess about 6 inches long by maybe 5 inches high. Um, Thunderbird 5 was um, the space station. Now that was quite clever because it was circular as it was in the series but underneath it had um, sunken wheels and when you put it on the floor and flip, switched it on, it went round in circles and said, you know, Thunderbird 5, this is International Rescue, and it had lights all the way around the bezel. Fantastic! For a kid who was five, who basically lived in industrial Manchester, I lived in black and white. The world was black and white when I was a little boy. Trust me on that. Um, people think who watch, um, let's say, Coronation Street now, um, they think that that is uh, just a soap opera, and of course it is, but that's where I lived. I lived in a street just like that, and I'm old enough to remember when the streets were cobbled before they actually decided to put tarmac down over them and that kind of thing. So when, when Thunderbirds came along, and you saw these wonderful, wonderful ships, and you saw things like, I mean, um, Fireflash. Now, Fireflash um, was a uh, Mac 2 um, passenger airliner. Now, this thing, you know, did New York, from London to New York in three, two, three hours, that kind of thing. And it, it was involved in a story where things went wrong on Fireflash. And if I remember rightly, uh, it was a bomb, I think. And um, Thunderbirds had to... Uh, uh, ensure that it got back down on the ground and of course the boys were triumphant um, but what I'm trying to say here is, is, is Concord hadn't been invented at that point um, I'm sure it was on the drawing board both here and in France but nobody had seen it and Jerry Anderson as is the nature of um, science fiction writers had looked ahead. He had seen that we'd come from prop-driven aircraft to um, jet-propelled aircraft, which had taken speeds. Uh, I mean, what? Supermarine Spitfire, 420 miles an hour, top whack, um, to uh, a jet fighter, which is going to be not in the early days, not quite the speed of sound. You know, uh, speed of sound 760 miles an hour in air, more or less variation on air density. Boring, nerdy, sorry. Um, so you're looking at somebody here, the same, you know, as Arthur C. Clarke, um, Bradbury's of this world, um, anybody who you can think of who, who writes science fiction has looked ahead and thought, right, okay. You know, we've built planes with propellers, great, not a problem at all. We now have jets, great. Where do we go next? Um, and, and we, you know, we're looking at um, somebody who said, right, you know, I think what's going to happen here is somebody at some point is going to build this airliner that in current day technology from London Heathrow to uh, Charles de Gaulle in Paris, let's say, will take <clears throat> an hour, hour and a half. Somebody's going to build an airliner. Excuse me. <clears throat> Not quite got over what was going on the last couple of days. But anyway, um, I'm going to, there's going to be an airliner that will do that in 35 minutes. So he looked forward and he designed Fireflash. If you've not seen Fireflash, and more importantly, if you've not seen Thunderbirds, look it up. I'm sure it must be on YouTube, and if not, it'll be on the internet somewhere. Um, you will be, hopefully, enraptured by it. Um, Fire Flash was a wonderful, wonderful thing and, and a prediction for the future. And sure enough, um, by 1968, Concorde was previewed. By 1969, I think it was May, uh, it did its uh, maiden flight. Um, how do these people know these things? Clever, you see. Clever. Um, so the new Thunderbirds are go wonderful. Um, so many nods to the original 
Thunderbirds, so many nods to um, Jerry Anderson's forward thinking. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to see that hopefully the um, wonderment, that's the word, that I used to experience as a five-year-old boy will be brought again to kids, new kids who are, you know, the Xbox generation and the PlayStation generation, that kind of thing, where technology, they've grown up with technology, there's never not been technology. Um, when you're in your 50s, you have come from a point in life where the biggest thing in technology, or certainly was when I was a kid, was a radiogram. Do you remember them? Does anybody remember them? A long cabinet, and in one end it had a, a record player, oh yes, with 33, 45, and indeed 78 RPM. Uh, in the middle, um, you had a, uh, a tuner. Uh, that's what high five buffs I would call. I called it a radio. And in the other end, you had slots for your LPs. Oh yes, your long playing records, boys. <laughs> um, so, and it was in this wooden cabinet, and but that was high tech as it got stunning. And then you got Jerry Anderson that showed you all these things that could be imagined. Absolutely wonderful. Wait there just a minute. Wait there. I'm back. Now, I'm one of those people that regrets giving away all my toys when I was a kid. Because have you seen the price of toys? Um... And I'm also one of those people who the things that are important to me, I look after. Let me show you this. That, people, is an original 1966 Fab One. Now, as you can see, there are a few chips on it. The registration number FAB1 is missing off the back. It is also missing off the front, because all it was was a sticker. But you will see that the crystals that they used to put in Dicky Toys when I was a little boy are still there. Now, if I pull the radiator grill down, the missile is still there. Look at that! Now, that's something that is never, never there. And inside, you've got the slide back roof, which still works. See? And inside, if you can see, you have both Parker and Lady Penelope. There she is. There she is. See? Home Parker. There it is. So that, that, people is a genuine 45 year old Fab One. I've been fortunate enough in my life to have seen the real Fab One twice. Um, I don't know whether you knew it actually existed. Well, when the program came out, I'm not too sure whether it was Rolls Royce, I have a feeling it wasn't. Um, somebody built a real one. Now, when I was little, it was on display at a department store in Manchester called Lewis's. Now, Lewis's was kind of uh, Manchester's version of Harrods, although we did have a store called Kendall Milne, which um, they would say they were Harrods. And to be honest, they kind of were. Um, but I was taken to Lewis's as a little boy to see Fab One. Nobody was let close to it. Nobody was allowed to touch it. And... Many, many, many years later, I went to Keswick in the Lake District, and there they had a museum called The Cars, The Star. Unfortunately, um, it never made a lot of money, and it, it survived for about a decade, and is now gone, sadly. Um, but they had the Fab One. Now, these were in the days where uh, props from movies, not like now, weren't worth anything. As soon as a movie was made, they were scrapped. So 
the, the man who owned that place was forward thinking enough to offer money or just to take off their hands a lot of movie cars and he had all sorts in there but Fab One was in there and I was able to get very close to it, as close as I am to this screen, touch it, smell it and uh, I relived again all the wonderment of, of Thunderbirds. So um, to wind up this one, um, if you haven't seen Thunderbirds Are Girl, watch it. If you were as old as me, watch it. If you were a fan of it when you were a child like me, watch it. It is fantastic. There's a lot of famous faces in it who do, do the voices, which you will enjoy seeing. Watch it. Um, and there is an allied program which is on catch up at the moment called Reggie and Thunderbirds Are Go, No Strings Attached, which is Reggie Yates and does a, a background thing about the making of the program. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful tribute to a wonderful, wonderful program. Um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and I hope you enjoyed this as, I, as much as I enjoyed reminiscing. So I will make another one today up to the hospital soon to see my wife um, so I shall speak to you later on. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye bye.